Welcome to this episode of Attitude. I'm your host, Mary Arnott. On Attitude, I have the opportunity and pleasure to talk with people about many different topics and experiences. Today, I'm talking with someone that I think will be interesting to people of all ages. This show is especially important to me because my guest is Hopkinton's very own Mike Hovagimian, a real marathon man. Thank you for being on the show today, well, Mike. Well, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. I was really looking forward to talking with you. Me as well. That's great. Uh, before I ask you to introduce yourself a little bit to the audience, I just wanted to mention that uh, I know you're running for the Hopkinton Historical Society yes, this am. year in the 123rd Marathon. Great group they have. And uh, we really appreciate it. Oh. As many people know, I um, do volunteer work at the Historical Society as well. And the funds that you will be raising will help keep the Historical Society open, the building, the History Center, down in 168 Hayden Row. We have so many artifacts from Hopkinton's history that's very important that we preserve. So I'm hoping that people will watch this and they will be generous in their donations to sponsor you for the marathon. We hope so. Yeah. So tell us a little bit first about your background. Um, how long have you lived in sure, Hopkinton? Sure, and yeah. whatever you want to share with us. Well, I guess uh, I'm, I'm pretty much of a local guy. Um, wasn't born in Hopkinton, but I've spent my whole life in probably a 25-mile radius. Actually born and grew up in uh, wonderful Worcester, Mass. And, uh, upon uh, graduating college, boy, back in the 70s. You don't have to. Yeah, you know, that's right, all right. I said that. Um, <laughs> I relocated out this way because, um, you know, as much as I liked Worcester, I mm -hmm. didn't feel as though kind of the inner city or at least, you know, that environment was what I really envisioned to, to raise a family. So um, moved to Hopkinton in uh, 1982 and have been here ever since. Well, a few years before me, I moved here in 1988. Okay, so, so that's quite a long time as well, yeah. <laughs> so I understand that you've run quite a few marathons. How did you get started? Uh, what sort of gave you the inspiration to run a Boston Marathon? That's a, that's a great question. I think living in Hopkinton, you kind of get uh, reminded of the event, you know, pretty aggressively every year. And as a member of the town, I would, uh, you know, look forward to every year coming out to the end of the street that I lived on to watch the runners go by. And uh, I was always amazed, even though the vantage point that I saw the race was the one mile mark, I was always amazed at the wide variety of people that I saw that were part of the event. There wasn't a distinct body type, age, gender, it, it, ranged, it, it ranged everything. And I, you know, kind of looked at myself and said, I look like them, I'm just an average person as well. Some year I'm gonna do this thing. And uh, I made the mistake over the next three or four years of talking that I was going to do it to the point where a group of people literally said, put your money where your mouth is. And although there was no money involved, they kind of, you know, fish or cut bait, you know, kind of goaded me to do it. Um, and so I, I threw down and said, you know, I'm actually going to run it. And what better time to run it than the, uh, the 100th running? Um, and the interesting fact with that specific race was I was slated to turn 40 the month after that event. So it would have been a perfect two-for-one special. I could have fulfilled the promise that I'd been making for the last three years of running mm -hmm. the event, and I would do something that would hopefully make me hold on to my youth a little bit just before I turned 40. And I uh, started training. I remember it was uh, the 1st of November of, of 1995. So that was just about six months before the marathon. And I remember going out for a run in my neighborhood, it was a one, one half mile loop, finishing that half mile loop, looking at my watch, being completely gassed, and saying there's no way I'm gonna be able to do this 52 times. And, uh, you know, stuck through it through the winter and actually, you know, got to the starting line uninjured and, uh, and ran the race. And uh, when I finished, it was a feeling like nothing I'd ever experienced before because for me, you know, there, there's always a, a point of the race where you say, why am I doing this? Why don't I just stop? I wish this were over. And when you actually do finish it, it's like, oh my God, I'm so glad I didn't stop. I'm so glad I did finish it. I feel great that it's done kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, after I did it, I, I, I felt, you know, really fulfilled, you know, didn't have anything bad happen and kind of said to myself, I don't know if I want to do this again, but I'm not going to 
quite give up on it yet. About a month later, I decided I want to do it again, that I wanted that feeling of challenge and that sense of accomplishment if you are able to finish the line, finish the cross, crossing the finish line again. So that ended up being the second year. The second year became the third year, and the fourth year, and the fifth year. And here it is. This upcoming Boston will be my 23rd, 24th consecutive of my 23rd official because the first year I wasn't able to get a number and I ran it as a bandit. Okay, that's what I was going to ask you yeah. because if you had never run any marathons before and then you just jumped nope. into the Boston Marathon, it couldn't have been with an official number. It was but not. you it did was it not. anyway. I mean, that's. That's significant. And 1996, the 100th, like you say. But you mentioned that living in Hopkinton, you got really inspired. Well, I never, <laughs> I got inspired too, but I got inspired <laughs> to go down and cheer yeah. you on. <laughs> cheer on the runners. I didn't get inspired to actually ever try one. It just wasn't something. But Well, I would tell you this, Mary. It's like I, I, I tend to be one of those people that, you know, is somewhat lax, but when I commit to something, I kind of get into it. Mm -hmm. And I actually did a limited amount of research and I found out, and it was substantiated by a couple prominent, you know, uh, I forget the exact term, people that study anthropological, I'm horrible, anthropological or whatever the term is, you know, like the, the evolution of, me, of man. Mm -hmm. And there was a prominent guy, I think his name was Daniel Lieberman from Harvard, who actually was a runner as well, and through a lot of studies of primitive man and through current testing determined with some substantiation that humans are the best suited animal that ever walked the earth for covering distance, that we were genetically designed to actually run long distance to the extent that it's been tested and proven that a human can run further than a horse, a camel, or, or, or any, a, a lion. And I think the reason for that is mechanically we're designed to, to perspire, which allows us not to overheat, where animals are only allowed to pan. And we're the only species, I think, that the article referenced that can run with their heads still erect. Mm -hmm. When you think of a horse or a dog, their heads go all over the place. So in, in a way, me running or you running or anyone running is almost like a duck swimming or a, a bird flying. It's something that we're genetically favored to do. And if we have an opportunity to just kind of open ourselves up to it, you know, we, we would be surprised. I mean, Will Farrell has run the marathon. Oprah Winfrey has run the marathon. And I'm just naming those two people out because they're people that you wouldn't don't, think would run. Yeah, people yeah. don't tend to identify them as, as distance runners, yeah. you know, based on, you know, their personalities, their lifestyle, their body style, or whatnot. So. Well, you may just have inspired many, many people to I, get I, out I, there I, and I do it. So. <laughs> I hope so. Maybe the animals are faster, but you can outlast them distance-wise. Yeah, so. I, I couldn't personally, <laughs> but, you know, I, I think if, 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 if put to the test, you know, a real elite athlete would outlast a horse. Yeah. Kind, kind of hard to believe, but the, the, the information seems to, to substantiate it. Now, some would say that you started, uh, you said, training for your first one six months in advance. Yes. And that people who have never run marathons before would normally start maybe even way before that, a year in advance or something. What do you do to prepare yourself and get yourself ready for running each year? That's a, that's a great question. Um, I never was one of those people that, and I hate to say this because the runners out there that hear this are going to probably hate me that currently might like me. <laughs> I don't really like running. I, I, I kind of do the running throughout the year as a means to an end, and the ends being hopefully to do Boston every successive year. Um, so my training has is, is always been on the minimal side, and it's worked for me. Um, I would, if I was trying to sell the concept of running to someone mm -hmm. like yourself, I spend no more than five hours a week involved with running. And when you think of five hours a week, it, you kind of make a parallel to a, a common sport like golf. The average person, if they were to golf one round or play one round of golf a week, mm -hmm. they would probably commit to spending more than five hours. So, so for me, um, it's, three, it's three days a week. I'll run like maybe on a Tuesday and a Thursday, and that run will be anywhere from four to six miles, something less than an hour. And the big one is on Sunday where I'll go anywhere from 12 to when I'm close to marathon training, 18 miles. And that might be, you know, a two or two and a half hour event. So again, you know, an hour on Tuesday, an hour on Thursday, 
in two to three hours on Sunday. It's only five hours a week. Well, some would say you must have magic feet then because that, yes, I've heard people train a lot, many more hours and go a lot more miles than you do. So glad you got those magic feet yeah, to get you I, through. Yeah, I've, I've, been, I've been blessed with some genetics. I yeah. have to thank both my parents for that. Yeah. Do you um, run with anyone during while you're getting ready? Is anybody, or train with anyone? or? I, I have a, a close friend that I met who used to live in town, Barry Camille. Mm -hmm. He's since relocated to Westboro, and we run on a regular basis throughout the year. We both have about the same ability, and we're actually almost the exact same age. And we use it as a way to stay connected mm -hmm. and to also motivate, motivate each other to get out there and run. Okay. But you're not members of running clubs? I am a member of the running club, but my, my, my work schedule, because I'm, I'm, I'm in the home repair business, and it's kind of difficult for me to project when my day may begin or end, so I mm -hmm. can't commit to regularly running a schedule with an extended group. But I, but I am a, m a member of the Hopkinton Running Club, and I do participate in a bunch of other races throughout the year where I get to connect with, the, with, with them as runners and as friends. Okay, so you're not doing just the Boston Marathon. No, no, no <laughs> At least no. you're getting some other yeah, uh, smaller yeah, events yeah, in, in yeah. there. Yeah, a couple, you know, some 5Ks. I just recently... Uh, did a, a, a local race that's, God, I think they said it was their 40th year, Stu's 30K. It's an 18.6-mile mm -hmm. run that goes around uh, Watches at Reservoir. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, from all your run, uh, races that you've run, is there one uh, that was your favorite that brought you the most excitement or whatever made it your favorite? Um, that's a great question. I mean, the, every, every race I've run, I've always felt really happy to just finish and start eating the food that they give you. You know, so that's, that's been consistent throughout. I would say, um, actually, strangely enough, uh, two years ago, mm -hmm. I ran a marathon in Lowell, the Bay State Marathon, in an attempt to qualify or requalify for Boston. And I had trained as I normally train and was projecting, based on the running that I had done, to come in at like 3.50, 3 hours and 50 minutes, 3 hours and 53 minutes, is, which is what I needed to qualify. And for whatever reason, I had one of those runner's highs that day, and I ran like a 3.38, which was 30 seconds a mile faster than any mile that I ran in training. And I, I wish I could... You were it. flying. Yeah, <laughs> I wish you could, you know, it's one, it's like on, and any runner will probably tell you, you have those days and you can't, necessarily predict when they're going to be and I was so blessed to have it on a day that I was racing and I was racing with a purpose that mattered kind of thing so I, I finished that run and I pretty much said to myself and a few other people if I were never to run another race again I could end it on this one because it felt so good. Well you mentioned the food that they give you afterwards do you go to the big pasta feast the night before as well? Or? I, 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 I haven't done that but once, uh, but I do avail myself of a lot of pasta eating locally. Mm -hmm. uh, a bunch of people in town, host runners, that I, that I, that I you know, involve myself with. Um, I'm more of a greasy food guy. I'm more of a <laughs> You cheese. certainly don't look like a greasy uh, yeah, food I, guy. Yeah, <laughs> you would be surprised. I, I would tell you, I, if you ask me honestly, I can't think of the last day of my life that I haven't had a meaningful, measurable quantity of potato chips. I, I would tell you, I would tell you, like there are runners I know that can say they've gone, you know, an ungodly number of days without missing a run. Mm -hmm. I've gone more than that without missing a handful of chips at a minimum. That that that's kind of my my Achilles heel. All right, kids, don't start eating a yeah, lot no, of chips. Bad, Stay away bad, from bad the junk advice. food. Yeah. It's just yeah. Mike can do it, but not you. Yeah. <laughs> No, and I would tell you, you know, I'll give a plug to the, I think it's the, 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 the a race that's held every year in Upton. It's called the, uh, the Boston Tune-Up, and it's two weeks before the Boston Marathon. And that race, bar none, has the best food. Mm -hmm. They invite the members of that local club to bring in their own homemade stew, chili, baked goods. It's an mm -hmm. incredible. I would never miss that race just because I look forward to the food. Well, I have to ask you, when you cross the finish line, first of all, two things. What keeps you going to get there? And then how do you really feel once you've crossed it, physically and mentally? Physically, I feel, thank God, I don't have to run anymore. I, I don't, <laughs> you know, I just i am so happy that it's over with kind of thing. Because for me, and I think it's a byproduct of not training enough, and that's kind of due to my age, my work schedule, 
in my, I don't really love running, so because I do a minimal amount of training, there's usually a reasonable amount of discomfort that I feel at the end. Mm -hmm. So I'm always so, so happy to get across the line. And I think what really, really motivates me is the other runners that are running the race. Because you see people that, at least in my mind's eye, I say they look like they're struggling, you know, either mentally or physically a lot worse than I am, and they're still doing it. So why can't I? The other thing that really, really helps is the spectators. You know, mm -hmm. seeing people out there in some of the worst weather conditions cheering you on, um, I, it's just incredible. It's like you feel like, you know, they're out here trying to support us. Let's, we should at least give it our best effort kind of thing. Well, last year was certainly terrible conditions. It rained so it? much. No, yeah, oh, yeah, it was, it was did a bad it? one. Yeah, yeah, you don't yeah. even remember, huh? Yeah, I no, was, yeah. <laughs> I, that was the first time I ever ran ever where I actually wore rain gear and I got soaked right through. Yeah, yeah. that was just, uh, that had to be one of the most miserable. Yeah. But, of course, we have to talk a little bit about 2013. Uh, Although I hate to bring it up, but um, I was going to ask you, was that pretty much the worst marathon you'd ever run? Because you were down near, not far from the finish line when the bombs went off, yeah, right? Yeah, that, 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 there's no question that that was the absolute worst marathon I ever ran and, and one of the worst experiences of my life. It was, it was really scary. Uh, I, I was running, not having a great day, as often as the case with me, and... Uh, you know, was probably a mile within the finish. And, you know, yeah, geez, I can't wait for this to be over with. My legs are dying. I'm out of gas. Probably didn't drink enough. Probably did a lot of things that only a rookie would do as a mistake. And here it is. It was probably my 18th or 19th marathon. And, uh, we, we, you know, me and the other runners in the group that I was running with, because there's always a pack within the Boston Marathon, I, we heard this ungodly loud noise that the best way I would describe it sounded like if someone abruptly dropped a full 40-yard dumpster and it landed flat on the ground, kind of an echoey sound. And this was right when we turned on Hereford Street, which is just before the last stretch when you finish. And, you know, you heard it and didn't really think that much of it. And then there was a second one. And then someone in the group c concluded or deduced that it might have been some sort of a celebratory cannon which made no sense. Why would there be a celebratory cannon mm -hmm. at 410 in the marathon? You know, we weren't w the winners of the race about to cross. And then, you know, I ran around the corner towards the finish. I could see the finish line in the distance. I was running toward it. And when I got to within probably about, uh, I don't know, 200 yards or so, uh, a bunch of people, you could see the smoke billowing from the side where the event took place. A bunch of people were running towards us and some of them were spectators, and they were really distraught and really terrorized, and they were yelling to myself and other runners, you got to get out of here, you got to get out of here. And there were some expletives, and I don't fault them for that. And, you know, I asked, what, what, what happened? And they go, there was a bomb, there was a bomb. And it was just unbelievable to think that could happen. You know, it was the last thing you would expect on that day, or in, in that community, just, just happening kind of thing. And, you know... A policeman came out and stopped myself and the other runners at that point, you know, just said, you know, that's it, the race is over. And, 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 and the first reaction, and I'll be honest, as any runner, is like, you've just been out there running for, you know, four hours and nine minutes. You need another 20 seconds to just cross that finish line. You know, I, I now can't do that. But then immediately when you realize what happened, it's like, oh, my God, people have, people got hurt. And I'm asking whoever I can ask, kind of what happened and where it was. Because for me personally, I was really afraid because my daughter had volunteered that year to be a nurse in, in the medical tent. And they're saying it went off near the finish line and the medical tent is near the finish line. And luckily a policeman, you know, with limited information they wanted to give out, I told them that and he said, no, anyone in the medical tent is okay except for what they're dealing with. And at that point, I turned around and just, you know, felt, I felt bad for what happened, but okay that at least my daughter, who was really in harm's way, was okay. Well, and she probably thought you really oh my might God. have been too, you know, it, so it, she's worried about you, you're worried about her. I, I yeah, had the just... worst crap phone that I took with me, excuse my English, and flipped it open, and for whatever reason, the sing signal was still live, and I was able to call her, and she was crying uncontrollably, as I was, and I just said, I'm, I'm okay, I'll find my way home. 
you know, it, it took about an hour and a half before my wife was able to come in because of the roadblocks, and she wasn't able to get me to almost Stero Drive. I had to, I had to, I walked to Fenway and then walked to the Charles and was on my way to Cambridge because you couldn't get in to get anybody. Oh my gosh! So after running almost 26 yeah. miles, you had to turn around and walk. It was, for it was, it was, it was horrible. It, it was horrible. Physically, was, that was just what a, an accomplishment just being able to do that. I yeah, mean, I mean the good news is it was a beautiful day. If it was like last year, God knows what would have happened. You know, hypothermia and other things, kind yeah. of thing. But, well. Um, it's forever part of the history, but it's not the marathon. That's so, a great way of phrasing you know, it. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. So I, I, you're really looking forward to this one, I hope. I'm looking forward to running them as far as I can or as long as I can. Oh, that, well, that was one of my other questions. Do you have any idea how many more you might run? You know, w when I started the whole marathon streak thing, it was probably like not any other, many other streaks. It's like, well, let's try to get to five. And then five became seven, so it's like, let's try to get to ten. And then I got to ten, and, you know, with limited research, I found out that there was a, a group, I think they call it the Quarter Century Club, that the BAA acknowledges as people who have run 25 consecutive Boston marathons. So I said, well, why don't I try to do that? And I set my sights for, the, for that. And around like the 15th or 16th marathon, it's kind of analogous to the 15th or 16th mile, I started saying, I'm never going to get there. Yeah, I got really discouraged. But then once I got over 20, it almost feels analogous to a marathon, like mile mm -hmm. 23, where I just want to hang in there and get a couple more in. But in all honesty, I don't really have a plan in stopping unless physically I can no longer do it. Well, I have no doubt that you will run many, many more. I hope you're right. I was even surprised that there's, you know, sometimes there, I think last year they had almost 20 people who were over the age of 80. That's amazing. That it's were amazing. running. It's amazing. So, it speaks to the point that I was trying to make earlier. We're all predisposed to run yeah. unless you have some, you know, physical, a bad knee, a bad back, a bad, I mean, not every, but if you, if you have a normal, you know, physical makeup with, with, mm -hmm. with, with a limited amount of training, you could cross the line. Absolutely. Well, I'd have to have more than a limit. I'd, I'd, ha I'd be happy to coach you. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I, I've got other things I want to do. Like, I want to do more interviews on HCAM and that kind of stuff. So yeah. I don't know about marathon. But I'll be cheering for you, that's Thank for sure. You. Yeah. I'll look forward to it. Uh, do you have, uh, what are you doing in terms of any fundraising or anything for the Hopkinton Historical Society? We're trying to get the word out there that you're running for us with our number, and we're very proud of that. Well, well, I'm obviously trying to circulate, you know, awareness to anyone that I know. Um, I'm blessed that uh, my family's been very supportive, and my wife's family's been very supportive, and you know, she's part of a real big family. There's eight siblings, mm -hmm. and uh, she works for a great company. And uh, we discovered after we made the commitment to the Hopkins Historical Society that they're on the approved list within Dell's charitable organization group. So um, she's actually spread the word to some of her coworkers, and if a Dell employee makes a contribution to the site that we have posted, which is a Dell site, uh, Dell actually matches it, which is uh, a great perk. So anybody out there that uh, is interested in, in donating to this great cause, if they can funnel it through one of their Dell Friends, it'll it'll go even longer. Oh, well, that's great. Yeah, and we'll put up a website yeah, at the yeah, end of the mean show to, to, to plug that. Too no, much no, that's either. okay. No, no uh, that's a good plug. We need it because yeah. you're running for a very good cause. I mean, preserving our history and being able to share that with future generations is very important. And the historical society runs on very limited funds. Uh, it's uh, it's all donations. It's a nonprofit. You know, five hundred one three C. And uh, so it's very important that this money will keep us going. I mean, can, so, can I speak to that just for one sure, second? Sure, I, I think that's a, that's a really strong statement. And the other statement that I want to make is, like, it's a great group. They do so much with so little, and, 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 and they get overlooked. I mean, like, when you think of the marathon fundraising phenomena, which is huge, mm -hmm. there are people that are saying they're running for, you know, a cure for blindness or ALS or heart disease, and they're all really, they, they, you know, the Hopkins Historical 
society, what they do pales in comparison. No one's, I'm not going to say that it's more important to track the history of a local community than it is to cure cancer. I would never even, that that's ridiculous. That's right. We but, understand but, that. Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah. But, but because of that, everyone, you know, neglects like I gave to that or I gave to that. And it's like, you know, I get that to a point, but, you know, preserving the history of this great community, there is definitely a value in that. Mm -hmm. And I think that if the group is to be supported, it has to be supported locally. That you can't expect people from around the country, as you could for a noted cause, to contribute. It has to be the people that live in this community. Yeah. Well, there are many, many good causes that people are running for, and not only for local yeah, things. Yeah, you, you but, get my point, though. But yeah. you know what? There's plenty to go around. That's right. There's That's so right. many people, and uh, some will give generously to many causes. That's right. Some will pick their favorite. I'm sure that there's plenty uh, to go around, including all of those good causes and the historical society. So we're not worried about it. Good. We know you're <laughs> going to do a great job Thank for you. us, and we really appreciate that. Is, uh, we're almost at the end of the oh, show, wow. believe it or not. I guess I was a little more long-winded than I thought. <laughs> no, you weren't long-winded at all. You Are did you a sure? great job. Is there any final thought you want to share or anything? Or just um, I'm, I'm glad that, that I had an opportunity to, to come here today, and it was a real pleasure meeting you. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to the big day. I'm, uh, you know, for, for a runner, we're getting to that stage now where it's getting somewhat close. Yeah. you got to do a, a few more long runs, but... Uh, you start to focus in on, uh, on getting to the starting line and hoping for a, a good weather day. Me too, and I'll be out there cheering you on. Awesome. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you so much for being here, Mike. My pleasure. Thank you, Mike, for being with me today and talking about the Historical Society and running the 123rd Boston Marathon. Your experiences and insight were very interesting. I wish you the best on April 15th of 2019 this year. Also, thank you to HCAM for making this show possible. To my audience, I hope you enjoyed hearing about Mike Scherer's experience. If you'd like more information about his fundraising, we'll put his website at the end of the show. Also, I want to put a special shout out to people who are challenged physically and to our seniors who are going to be running the race this year. I'm Mary Arnott, signing out with Attitude. Thank you. Mm -hmm.